Welcome. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Jonathan Faust here and welcome to this webcast. Delighted to have this time with you. We are now um, at the seventh of the seven factors of awakening. I um, hope this has been helpful for you. It's so foundational to practice and remind myself all the time um, how important it is to cultivate these factors. Equanimity, steadiness in the midst of change. That's what this little meditation and talk is all about. It's considered the flower of practice. Can you maintain a sense of presence no matter what's going on inside and going on outside? It's a juicy thing to cultivate and it's worthy. Before we launch into this meditation, big thank you to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington and to Glenn Harrison, our producer. Also, a major thank you to Rita and to Ray. Mindful movement at 630 Eastern Standard Time with Rita Moran will guide you mindfully into movement. Big surprise there. Very, very helpful. Mindful movement is such a great way to prepare for meditation. Afterward, you can join with Ray Maniocchi, who leads the Mindful Dialogue. Just a really wonderful time with like-minded friends to talk about mindfulness in today's life. Those links are on my website and on my Facebook page. This is all offered freely. It's all offered in the spirit of dana or generosity. Uh, we, none of us receive any direct compensation for this offering. It's really done out of joy, appreciation for how these practices have changed our lives. And generosity keeps this thing flowing. So if you feel inspired, um, part of the challenge for me is actually receiving support to make this happen. And uh, thank you. Let's see. If you like, there's a newsletter that I uh, offer. It's a weekly, to which will update you as to what's coming up, as well as a monthly or every other month now, offering my photography and summary of, of recent talks and other resources that might be helpful in your practice. So those are there as well. Sometimes I like to think of meditation practice in three stages. We can think of using focus or concentration as a way of kind of willfully training the puppy of the mind. You know, come on back and sit, come on back and sit, come on back and sit. Then the second stage we can think of as flow, where once, you, once you're seated, once you have that sense of presence, the sense of like the witness, the observer, then you can sort of like expand your attention and notice what's changing, notice your relationship to what's changing. You really get a sense of the flow, the stream of sensations, thoughts, feelings, moods, states, all of that. You begin to watch it or witness it. The final stage we can think of as letting go or letting be which is moving from doing to the sense of, of allowing, of holding that sort of like steady sense of presence as you watch all the fluctuations of energy, mood, feeling, thought, states. So that's a little of what we're going to explore uh, in this following short meditation. Focus, flow, let go, or concentration, sort of meditative awareness of flow and softening, letting go. If you're a yoga file, you can think of it in terms of dharna, dhyana, and samadhi. Dharna, one-pointed attention, laser focus. Dhyan is more of like open, spacious awareness, mindfulness. And samadhi is the sense of surrender. You're actually, it's a literal surrender into what is. I find these three steps help me to get to that last stage because you can't just jump into that last stage of just surrender and be because the mind is, that's the mind. So how would you like to move? Let your body move in any way that would support you for this medita meditation. Work out any kinks, any wiggles, anything that's calling for your attention, little micro adjustments to your posture. Perhaps as a way of cultivating concentration and absorption, you might bring your hands right about at shoulder level. Close your eyes, relax your breath, soften the muscles of your face. Relax your fingers and thumbs and feel on the inside, feel the space. Can you imagine or feel the space inside your palms? Can you feel or imagine the space inside your thumbs? 
Can you feel or imagine the space inside your fingers? Can you feel or imagine the space between your thumbs and your forefingers? Can you feel or imagine the space between each of the fingers? And imagine now if someone was watching you, they could barely perceive movement. Let your hands begin an ultra slow motion descent down toward your lap. This is a practice of absorption of both concentration and a deep relaxed receiving. If someone was watching you, they could barely perceive movement. Wherever you find your hands, whether they've come to rest, whether they're still in transit, hands are soft. You might imagine your face relaxed, expressionless. All the muscles of the face deeply relaxed. feeling the inside of your mouth and relaxing your tongue, letting your tongue fill your lower jaw. Feel the arms heavy, like heavy drapes hanging from your shoulders as you sense down through the elbows, and down through the wrists. Sensing again the palms and fingers and thumbs and noting here if you can sense any pulse or tingling or vibration. Lower back and the belly, soft. And sensing down the length of the legs from the hips to the knees. The backs of the knees. The knees down through the ankles. The tops of the feet and the toes. the soles of the feet and the heels. What could soften or relax or let go right now? What could soften, relax, or let go even more than that? From this deep place of relaxation, gently guiding your attention toward the breath or toward the sounds around you. Noting if it's possible to sustain attention on whatever you choose as your anchor, where you feel the breath the most predominant, perhaps the sound vibrations, maybe the feeling in the palms. For these next few minutes, when the mind wanders, guiding your attention back to the here and now.
can you sense here the what it means to take the seat of the witness of who you are as the observer of all that changes? And you might sense what it's like to attune yourself to the flow of change. Everything that is changing, the sensations, the breath, the thought forms, moods, even states. Using your anchor as a way of re-arriving and then in your own way, relaxing, softening, widening your attention to acknowledge and to sense this quality of flow. Focus helps you to arrive. When you sense the breath right now or the sounds right now, you are in the here and now. Flow develops and cultivates your sense of the witness, your capacity to be the non-judging observer of what presents and what changes. And you might explore in our remaining time, just a minute or so, this quality of letting go, of letting be. Is it possible to let things be just as they are? Nothing to change, nowhere to go. Simply to be, to receive this moment just as it is. Now, very gently letting go of all technique and just resting in presence. Just feel the imprint, this imprint of focus, flow, and let go or let be. In your own time, beginning your transition. This seventh of the seven factors of awakening is considered the, the flower of practice, equanimity or steadiness in the midst of change, certainly an element to cultivate in these days. I hope you find the following talk helpful. It's a joy and delight to share these practices with you. This seventh of the seven factors of awakening is considered the, the flower of practice, equanimity or steadiness in the midst of change, certainly an element to cultivate in these days. I hope you find the following talk helpful. It's a joy and delight to share these practices with you. There was once a man who decided that no matter what, he wanted to know and to meet God. 
dedicated his life to this search, searching everywhere, internally, externally, a life utterly, utterly devoted to this realization. And then one day he discovers the house of God. And he comes up and he sees the little nameplate there on the door, God. And he very excitedly begins to, he's just about to knock on the door. And he realizes, wait a minute, if I actually meet God, I'm going to have to give up everything. I'm going to have to give up my whole sense of self, my dreams, my story, everything. I've got to let it, I have to let it go. And kind of overcome with anxiety and fear, he, he very, very quietly backs away, makes his way down the steps so as not to make a little creak, and starts running as fast as he can. And then he goes on to become a teacher, teaching people how to find God. <laughs> Sometimes I think I'm that guy. I've certainly had my, my, my experiences of great shifts in consciousness. And I'm also aware of that, that inner anxiety of like, do I really want to let it all go? And I think, I think we all want to wake up on some level. We all want to be happy, but, but do we really? You know, there are so many obstacles. There are so many things to surrender to in this life. You know, in these teachings in Buddhist psychology, when the Buddha says nothing whatsoever is to be clung to as I or mine, that's heavy stuff. Nothing whatsoever is to be clung to as I or mine. Of course, we've all had that taste of when I and mine falls away or when it becomes porous. Those are the moments where we feel the mystery, where we feel expansiveness. But, but to let it all go. Well, we're going to find out eventually. I'd like to talk about the seven factors of awakening. We've been working through uh, these factors of awakening, and I'd like to talk um, as a review of them, but also to talk about the seventh, which is kind of considered the flower of practice, which is equanimity and steadiness. I'd like to talk a little bit as well of how bringing steadiness and equanimity into your practice can help you work with your deepest challenges. And also to talk a little bit about, about how we can bring this into action in the world. You know, there, there's so much to be upset about in the world right now. So much polarization, so much anger, so many deep-seated generational wounds coming to the surface. And it seems, at least to me, that this is the time now more than ever when, when these practices are so critical. To become more self-aware, to become more aware of others, to become more aware of stress and suffering, and to be able to respond with wisdom and loving presence. This is really, really important right now. And I think that... <clears throat> To have an understanding of these seven factors of awakening and how to apply them can help you not only work with the challenges that you encounter in life that are between you and finding God, <laughs> whatever that means for you, but also how to, how to be in the world, how to, how to work in the world. You know, I love leading our, um, our New Year's retreats. Um, instead of a seven-day retreat, it's a five-day retreat. And they always have this really strong emotional intensity because most people are, they schedule the retreat and, they're, and they have a sense of urgency. Like, I have got to figure out my life for this next year. I got so many issues to deal with and I got to get a handle on them. And in one of the interviews with one of the practitioners, I was asking her, well, how's your practice? What are you noticing? And she said, well, I'm, I'm scattered. I'm exhausted. And to be honest, my, my meditation practice feels really grim. 
everything seems so dark and I'm, and I'm judging myself for judging myself and I, I, I can't get out of it. And I, and I really need to figure this out because I got a life to live and I want to live it fully. And I, and I, and I was touched by her, by her struggle. I certainly know that one well. And I suggested that instead of trying to figure things out right now, maybe she could just, just invest in the practice. Uh, bring in more rest and and just let there be more of a natural gathering of attention. And maybe maybe things would lighten up. And certainly I've found that for myself, that when I feel that sense of urgency, I've got to figure it out. What I really need is to slow down. As the Quakers say, don't just do something, sit there. And there's something so magical about, about pausing. If you've ever had a creative project that's on your mind and you're worried about it and you're, you're slogging through it and then maybe one day you just sit down and like the muse is there and all the conditions are right and boom, it just comes through pretty quickly. I have certainly noticed that for myself and I'm fascinated about the creative process. I can't make myself be creative but I can create the most supportive environment I can for that, for that to flow. And the more, the more I'm aware of my own patterns and my own cycles and when I have energy and when I don't, I try to gear my life around that creativity to, to mine when the conditions are best, which for me is in the morning. But it's the same way with these practices that lead to liberation and to freedom. It's helpful to really look at the conditions that best support you. It also comes down to actions. Like what are the practices that, that light you up and, and fill your cup? What most helps you be present for yourself and for, for others? In this tradition, uh, continuity and, and, and growth in, in awakening, it's not so much dependent on what you believe, but on what you're practicing and what, you, what you're cultivating through your actions. And if you want to be awake, if you really want to wake up to that ultimate truth, then awareness of these seven factors of awakening can be really, really helpful. Helpful. It's not, a, it's not a doctrine. It's not something you have to sign up for to believe. They're, they're really inherent qualities that live inside you and, and they sustain your practice. They, they can help to cultivate a really rich internal world. And I do feel that ultimately this practice is about getting free, that when you're, when you're knocking on the door <laughs> with God's nameplate on it, whatever that means for you. That the practice is about seeing clearly, about seeing clearly into the nature of reality. And studying the kind of the mechanics of, of the practice can be really, really helpful. And, and the six factors that we've been exploring, they all kind of lead toward what's considered this, the seventh factor of awakening of what's called equanimity or, or steadiness. Like having your, your keel, the keel of your boat firmly in the water. So equanimity, what does that mean? One of my favorite quotes, life is not difficult for those who have no preferences. Make the slightest distinction between good and bad and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. Those lines from the third Zen patriarch have always given me a sense of peace, maybe, maybe a little glimpse of what's possible. Life is not difficult for those who have no preferences, but make the slightest distinction between good and bad and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. In some ways that points toward this preferenceless awareness of just being present. But on the other hand, they can also be a setup. Not only can they 
kind of set you up for self-judgment when you're not there. <laughs> like, wow, what is preferenceless awareness? What does that really mean? But, but that preferenceless state could also easily slide into indifference. It can also point out to just relentlessly revealing how preferential you are all the time. And in my experience, that can be really discouraging and frustrating, ultimately in a good way. But noticing your preferences is a really important part of this practice. Noticing how the mind is constantly pushing away and reaching toward. So I'd like to do a little internal review of these of these seven factors of awakening. So if you'd like, you can close your eyes. This will be just, for just a short little reflection. And again, think of these as internal states. You might take three slow, deep breaths right now. And soften on the out breath. And if you would, just, just sense this, these qualities that are inherent inside. And you might sense them, how they, how they exist inside right now. Or if you can't contact them, you might just sort of sense your willingness to, to make room for that state. One quality is this, this inner quality of mindfulness. Your capacity to observe without judgment. Take a breath. Imagine or feel that inside. The second quality is this the quality of investigation, your capacity to look ever more closely at what is actually here and now. The third quality is, is, is cultivating energy, a, a vitality, a, a sense of resilience to, to stay in the moment with what is here. The next is a quality of, a quality of joy, a, a sense of joy of discovery. The next is a, is a quality of, of tranquility, of relaxation. And you might sense now, is it possible to soften in any way? Your capacity to open and allow. And the next quality is the quality of concentration or one-pointedness. Can you sense the power of attention itself when it is directed with awareness. And sensing now this quality of equanimity, a quality of preferenceless awareness. You might sense the image of a tree kind of bending in the wind, rooted, but at the same time aware of and going with the flow, non-resistance. And if you like, you can now deepen your breath. If you like, you can open your eyes. These, these factors of awakening, in, in some ways, they seem kind of contradictory, don't they? On the one hand, we're kind of calming, and on the other hand, we're energizing. On the one hand, you're relaxing, but on the other hand, you're concentrating. And it really is the bringing together of these elements that kind of combine into this sort of this optimal state for, for awakening. So a little bit about, about equanimity. And I love that image of the tree bending in the wind because one element, or think of two primary aspects, one is stability. 
that in order to be present, you there's a physicality to it, feeling strong and feeling stable in your body, really helpful. But also a quality of, of emotional stability, a sense of emotional resilience. This is your capacity rather than reacting to, to kind of respond. It's not automatic pilot. It's not just sort of like setting the automatic pilot. It's actually being intimately present to what's here, but seeing what's there and then responding. Another quality to equanimity is calling on wisdom, uh, the capacity to, to see clearly. And, and the, the, the word upeka in the original language of the Buddha, one of the translations is to, to gaze over as if, as if from on high. I remember, I can't remember who it was, but they spoke of how when we started to explore moving beyond the planet and we got our first glimpse of earth from the moon for the first time that that according to this author was the possibility of a kind of a harbinger of a consciousness shift that we could actually see ourselves from outer space and many of those who have had the opportunity to to be in the International Space Station or to, to travel to, to the moon have talked about the, the mystical transformation of what it's like to, to look down on ourselves from this vast sense of space. A dear friend of mine who is long past, Sheila Morgan, is a, is a therapist and she had a a poster of the earth from the moon directly across from the chair where her, her patients would sit. And occasionally she would say, you know, when you consider what you're struggling with right now and you, and you look at that poster, well, what's it like to hold them both? So wisdom is sort of that, 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 that clear view. And from that standpoint, where you, you can see what's arising, you can see what's passing through. You can make room for wisdom and you can make room for loving presence. When you're reactive, that's not possible. So equanimity actually makes room for wisdom and makes room for, for compassion and kindness to flow. So upeka, Equanimity, steadiness, it's considered kind of the crown jewel of the practice. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the shadow side is it can look like indifference, but it's really the genuine experience. It's, it's a very sublime state. It's allowing your, your, your inner life to really, really be there, to, to trust life. It's kind of a, it's a non-distracted state and really kind of a generous state where you can actually allow things to be as they are. You can allow your heart to flow in the response to what is there. It may not ultimately be kosher to talk about this because it's, it's a little bit different, but I, was fortunate enough to take part in the uh, study at Johns Hopkins, uh, exploring the effect of um, high dose psilocybin on long term meditators. And during during the course of my my adventure, which was quite powerful, um, every hour I would we would check in and we'd go through a checklist so they could sort of track uh, track the progress. And at one point in my, in my experience, one of the questions was on a scale of one to 10, what is your, your negative emotional valence? Like, like right now on a scale of one to 10, what is it like to, to kind of feel pain and suffering? When I heard the question, I said 10. I just, just caught in the, the, the turmoil and suffering of life. 
The next question is, what is, on a scale of one to 10, what is your positive emotional valence? Your capacity to feel positive emotion? And I said, 10. And I realized in that moment, really seeing the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows of life, the reality of stress and suffering, and the reality of the perfection of it all. It was a profound glimpse of equanimity. And we, and we, all, we all need that sense of steadiness right now. We, we, all, we all need to be, have access to that sense of spaciousness. Not just for ourselves, but to be in the world. When we can access this, it can open up our capacity to grow dramatically because that spaciousness allows you to see what's real. It allows you to see what's true. And there are times in my practice when I can really feel the deep searing wound of some pain in the past completely uncovered. And when I can do that, quite often, what follows with that is some form of loving presence, some sense of kindness, some sense of kind of a healing balm. And so with so much discord in the world right now, so much polarization, people pulling guns on each other over wearing a face mask or not, and domestic violence being up so much, a drug overdose is being up so much, that we're all more and more aware of what gets in the way of equanimity. And here in this tradition, we speak of these five, five mental states that occlude all possibility of being present. And their most simple terms, it's a mind that's filled with greed, a mind that's filled with hatred, a mind that is consumed with worry, a mind that is afflicted with sloth and torpor, sleepiness, heaviness, or a mind that's afflicted with doubt or self-criticism. Our practice ultimately is about coming in contact with these five mental states and finding a way to, to be with them. Some when deep in their practice was really caught up in some family pattern stuff, original family pattern stuff. And certainly these days, those who are kind of stuck with family are very, very much up in, in seeing the old entrenched patterns that are very, very hard to shift when you're in a family, family pattern. And one thing that he was completely caught in was feeling so disappointed and so angry with an older sibling. And as he found himself moving into his meditation practice, he was just consumed with, with this deep upset. And he described it as kind of an, an unrelenting knot. And so with this practice of rain to, to recognize what's there, to sense if you can allow it or make room for it, to investigate it, to bring a sense of nurturing to it, he elected to take a closer look at this, this knot. And he saw that through this lens of these, these hindrances or these five mental states that he saw that he was afflicted with, with hatred. He just hated his older sibling and he hated himself for hating his older sibling. He was afflicted with doubt. You know, he doubted this would ever get better. He was worried that, that this would never, never go away. And so when he moved into this practice of, of rain, recognizing the, the affliction and then sensing if he could be with that to make room for it, which in this case he was. 
and then to really sense how his whole body, how his nervous system held that issue, to feel that knot, and just to be with it. And then to open into loving presence, to nurture it with a sense of kindness or compassion or empathy. He could begin to feel a little bit of a shift at first. And as he sat with it, he thought, well, what can I say to my, to my, my older sibling? that could possibly create a shift here. And he realized she's not going to be able to hear this. Uh, she's not interested, and, and she really doesn't have the bandwidth. And again, a deeper sense of sadness. And then, and then this question popped into his mind, and he just thought, well... Can I, can I just accept her knowing that she'll never change? And he got that image of that tree and the wind where he realized maybe it's possible, just a recognition. Maybe, maybe I'll never be able to have that conversation. Maybe I'll never be understood by my elder sibling. Can I hold that with empathy and kindness? And he began to feel a shift. He began to tap into a little, just a sense of that quality of equanimity. Can I just let it be? Can I hold it? And I love that story because it, it points toward, toward possibility. And I thought it might be interesting to do just a short meditation. And again, just to explore maybe something that's up in your life and just to sense what it's like to kind of run it through the filter of these seven factors of awakening. And, and we'll see what happens. Um, as someone wise said, the, the only outcome from this little meditation will be you'll feel better, you'll feel worse, or you'll feel the same. So prepare yourself for one of those options. And if you like, you can close your eyes and... And you might bring into mind just something that's problematic in your life, something that's kind of just between you and feeling good right now. And you might take three slow, deep breaths and just take the next little while just to sense what might you want to spend a few minutes with. It can be helpful to, to really get, get specific if you can. And to kind of help you with this, it might be helpful to sense if you can create a, a little bit of a visual, a visual representation of some challenge in your life. Or are there any words or sounds that you associate with it? And turn your attention to what it feels like inside. How does how does your nervous system hold this issue in your life right now? And you might just sense in regard to these five mental states, is there, is there a quality of, of hatred, of anger or ill will, aversion? Is there a quality of, of, of wanting, of desire? Can you sense any quality of, of worry or a kind of restlessness or agitation about this issue? Is there a sense here of, of a kind of sloth and torpor or heaviness or losing energy or a kind of a downward spiral of energy that you experience here. And do you notice any quality of doubt or 
self-criticism. And now, as you sense this and how it lives on the inside, without trying to fix it, without trying to figure it out, let's just see what it's like just to hold it while you simultaneously reflect on these, these factors of awakening. And primarily, if you can let your attention be with, with kind of the felt sense, the kind of the somatic experience of it inside. If you were to hold this with a sense of, of mindfulness, of, of non-judging awareness, what's that like inside? Is it possible to bring to this a, a, a deeper quality of investigation, a willingness to kind of look more closely at, at what this is like? Can you imagine bringing a sense of, of energy to it, a sense of like resilience? Can you imagine a, a quality of, of, of joy, like a, a quality of, of joy of a joy of discovery, something you might learn here that might enliven you in some way? Can you imagine invoking a sense of, of calm, of relaxation or tranquility? What's that like inside? And if you were to call on concentration or one pointedness, so you might in a way sharpen your attention to what is here. And in your own way, calling on a quality of equanimity, a quality of allowing, this sort of oh, a looking over from a distance or from on high. And just take the next few moments, just a sense, as you reflect on these qualities, what's this, what is this like inside? How does it shift? How does it move? And now as you reflect on these qualities, on what it's like inside right now, you might just reflect on the following question. What advice do you have to give yourself right now? After being with us for a few moments, what advice do you have to give yourself? And if you were to do that, not perfectly and not all the time, what might that feel like? If you like, you can deepen your breath. If you like, you can open your eyes or you can remain with them closed and With the remaining time I have, I'd like to jump into just a little more esoterica around these five mental states and, and how they relate to these seven factors of awakening. Naturally, when you, when you encounter sloth and torpor, kind of like the heaviness, the kind of the spiraling down, well, then you can call on, on investigation and energy and, and joy. These are, the, these are the factors that are enlivening to bring, sometimes just to bring a little more energy and can be really, really helpful. If you look closer, you'll, you'll see more, you'll feel more. Calling on kind of the joy, the joy of discovery can be really helpful. 
On the other hand, if you encounter a lot of restlessness and worry where the mind can't settle at all, at all well, then here you call on these factors of relaxation and calming and tranquility. You might call on, on concentration as a way to gather your attention to what is present. You might call on equanimity, that quality of spaciousness. Because the very center of, of this is, is mindfulness, non-judging awareness. You know, quite often, either we have too much energy or not enough energy. So we're always trying to find that balance. And it's kind of easy to overthink it and, and intellectualize it too much. But essentially, really what it comes down to is what's happening right now. And it might be, wow, I'm losing steam or I don't, I don't have the energy to be with it. Or it might be like I'm too agitated, I'm too restless. So that question of what is happening helps you to, to identify what's here. And then you can ask, well, how can I be with it? Or what is this, what is this need right now? And those two essential questions will, will really help to guide you through your practice and particularly through, through challenges. As one of my teachers once said, life is therapeutic irritation. You know, we, we grow through our challenges and chances are your greatest growth has been when you've really, really been challenged. And I think it's really helpful sometimes to reflect on, on these qualities that can really support you in being more alive and in your own pursuit of what's most important. It's one thing to live in a cave where the disturbances are really really minimal, but, but what about living in the world? You know, how do you, how do you practice and how do you cultivate this sublime state of equanimity of steadiness in life? And we all have our own conditioning. We all have our own natural tendencies to shut down or go into self-preservation or to lash out or get lost in our own particular desires. And being aware of these states, these five states that get in the way, and then these seven factors of awakening can be helpful. And, you know, I live in the woods outside of Washington, D.C., and one particular problem we have is that all the trees were cut down at the same time, about, about 100 years ago, at least where I live. So now we have these beautiful, majestic trees, beautiful, mature trees, but, but many of them are dying, and they're dying at the same time. And it's amazing to see these kind of grandfather, grandmother trees, when they, when they come down, the hole that they leave in the woods is, it's a huge gash in the woods. And when I first moved into the woods, I would just sort of feel the tragedy of that. But then you start to see the life that occurs, how, how so quickly it's a new, it's a new ecosystem. Suddenly there's small plants and there are bushes and there may be one small tree that suddenly has the sun and the large trees make the small trees impossible to grow. It's kind of the same thing with these five mental states. That when you are caught in greed, hatred, restlessness, sloth and torpor and doubt, it's, it's kind of impossible for anything else to grow. And why remembering and recalling these factors of awakening can be so helpful. Calling on non-judging awareness. Your capacity to turn toward what is challenging and investigate it. To call on resilience and, and energy. To recall the, the joy of, of self-discovery to remember to relax, to use concentration as a tool for calming and focus, and then to call on equanimity and allowing and spaciousness. And can you sense how each one of these factors, they're already there. It's a question of remembering them and making room for them. So these factors of awakening are they're like they're like seedlings. 
And it's a question of like, what is it that, what is it that enhances the five mental states of the hindrances? Well, it's reactivity. It's unexamined reactivity. And what is it that enhances the seven factors of awakening? Self-observation, pausing, relaxing and allowing. Part of it is learning how to sharpen your attention to be aware of what's happening as it's happening. As soon as you can name a hindrance, I always imagine it'd be great to have a game show, you know, name that hindrance. <laughs> Where you as, as soon as you can name it, you can tame it, as someone said, not very eloquently. But it's also helpful to remember that everything, everything you seek is found within. What covers your essential nature can be revealed to you when you slow down and when you pay attention. It's always this question of how much control do you really have over your life? You know, I love seeing little kids in the grocery store, you know, the, the carts that have the wheel, and you can, see, you can see there's some little kids who they really think they're driving the cart as they make their way down the aisle. That's pretty much us. I don't know how much control we have, but we do have awareness. We do have a capacity to heighten our attention to see what's real. And you do have a capacity to open to loving presence, to call on kindness and compassion and joy. And that's what opens us to equanimity. That's what allows us to open to the mystery. We're going to close with a short little reading, short little reflection. If you like, you can close your eyes now and take three slow, deep breaths. When we are afraid, we move into self-preservation we move into an instinct to try to control. When we feel trust, when we feel a certain kind of verified faith inside, it allows us to open to the mystery. Reflecting on the following words, The saint knows that the spiritual path is a sublime chess game with God and that the beloved has just made such a fantastic move that the saint is now continually tripping over and bursting out in laughter and saying, I surrender. Whereas, my dear, I'm afraid you still think you have a thousand serious moves. These seven factors of awakening are these latent qualities that are already within. The more you relax, the more you pay attention, the more you call on sincerity in your practice, the more these factors will naturally become more present, the more naturally you will be guided by wisdom and by a loving heart. May that be so for you. May that be so for everyone you care about in this world. And may that be so for all beings. Thank you so much for your time and for your attention. Best wishes to you in your practice and in all that you are called to in your life. Thank you. <laughs>